Um, now my regular opener, Chief Craner, now is uh, get, we're getting into uh, the habit. But uh, I wanted uh, to, her, to start with uh, our dose program. So. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning, everybody. I'm excited today to continue the fire department's main function of prevention. We respond when prevention ends up not working like we want it to. And so it's not just fire prevention, it's also injury prevention. So our community risk reduction team is very robust. We're introducing a new program to make sure that we are working with families to educate them on safe sleep. And I'm excited about this. Our firefighters are excited about this. Our fire marshal's office is excited about this program as well. I'm going to introduce Allison Anderson from Healthy Start. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning, everyone. My name is Allison Anderson. I have the privilege of serving as Executive Director at Escambia County Healthy Start Coalition, and we are tremendously grateful for the leadership of the city and especially Chief Craner to bring the DOSE program to West, uh, West Florida. We are the first on the panhandle. At Healthy Start, we strive for every baby to make it to their first birthday and have the healthiest outcome possible but we are not doing as well as we could and should to prevent infant mortality in our community. We have one of the highest rates in the state of Florida and especially so in communities of color. And to bring this prevention program direct on scene education, whoa, did I do that? Uh, it's a heavy mic, you got it? Okay, we're good, we're good. We're excited to bring this program uh, to Pensacola and all of Escambia County. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. For tech support so for now for now we're good we're good um 30 percent of the deaths infant deaths in our community are related to unsafe sleep practices and environments and it is our hope and and prayer and plan that we can reduce and mitigate a large majority over the of, of those in the months weeks and years ahead through this program so thank you so much Certainly, yeah. Uh, any questions uh, for them that um, we'll, when we get to the question uh, portion, we'll uh, happy to take, or if you guys have questions now, uh, happy to take those. But yeah, thank you so much for the Healthy Start for our fire department again, uh, to focus on things that, that are really uh, impactful for our community. And, and again, something that uh, there's a lot of divisiveness maybe in uh, our, our uh, city, our county, our country. Uh, but one thing we all agree on is uh, trying to keep all of our children safe and really treating uh, every child like they're ours. So, um, so very, very excited for that. Thank you guys. Uh, a couple of quick notes and uh, things we'll talk about, and then I'll happy to take your questions. Um, uh, we've got a, another mayor's neighborhood cleanup on Saturday, uh, September 23rd. So that won't be this coming Saturday, but Saturday after in the scenic Heights neighborhood and Spanish trail area. And of course, you should get something in the mail and you can look on our website to see if your street uh, or your neighborhood is included in that one on Saturday, September 23rd. We've got a District 3 Town Hall with Councilman Casey Jones. That will be uh, Tuesday, September 26th at 530 at Bayview Community Center. So uh, looking forward to seeing you there and taking your questions there for District 3 folks. Uh, we did uh, start the sidewalks on McClellan Road. That was one of the things that, uh, that we had, had funded in the carry forward with, right when, after I had started. Um, so that'll be McClellan Road and Hallmark Drive between Seymour and Tronjo. And the uh, weather permitting, the construction should finish uh, in sometime in November. And, and um, that was a priority for us at that point because uh, in Cordova Park, the, uh, on the way to Cordova Park Elementary, uh, there were situations where uh, people are having to walk in the street in in car line ultimately and uh, there wasn't the, the path that that really needed to be there to make sure that that uh, everyone could walk to cordova park there so we the, that is now uh, finally underway and should be done by november asking for support in the usa today uh, reader's choice awards for the pensacola international airport it's been nominated in the best small airport category and the voting uh, goes until october 2nd and if you go on our city website or our facebook page uh, you'll be able to uh, to help vote and help support uh, Pensacola International in getting some of that national recognition. Um, we do have, uh, I see Brian in the back, we have our Supplier Diversity Exchange event is tomorrow from 8.30 to 3 p.m. I certainly appreciate him taking this on as, as he always does, and we're partners in that, and I will be there 
uh, to welcome everybody in the morning. It's free and it's geared towards small, small business owners and suppliers, and it'll feature panel discussions, presentations, and networking opportunities. So, um, excuse me, I'm sorry, I say tomorrow, I'm, uh, excuse me, Thursday, September 14th, 8.30 to 3. Um, so not tomorrow, not Wednesday, Thursday. Um, so anyway, thank you, Brian, for putting that on, and I'm excited uh, to, to be there, and it's always very well attended, and I think a very uh, great asset for our community. The couple other uh, things, I mentioned premium sanitation service. Uh, as we move again to the twice a week service, twice a week pickup, which means you got to remember twice a week to roll your can out, uh, there is that premium sanitation collection. Um, that uh, you know yourself or you could certainly sign up loved ones or parents and grandparents um, that for it's a it's twenty dollars a month but ultimately you'd be able to leave the can uh, right there in your driveway or uh, somewhere where our folks can get it uh, they'll roll it to the curb roll it back um, and uh, make life a little bit easier on you so um, that's a service we've provided for a long time but you know, we really haven't uh, you know pushed too aggressively but now the fact that the cans will be going out twice uh, I think it's important to point that out. So you can call 435-1890, uh, or certainly you can also call 311 or whatever other channels or through our through our website to get more information. And uh, re recycling sanitation changes. Uh, I mentioned these last week to go into twice a week collection. Uh, we have sent postcards out uh, to all of our, our citizens, all of our 21,000 uh, uh, sanitation customers uh, to make sure that they're aware and those postcards are tailored specifically to their current pickup date so the postcard that you get uh, should have no if, if you're a Monday pickup it gives you your new dates if you're a Tuesday pickup uh, uh, it gives you your dates and um, and so anyway we've we've uh, done everything we can on the outreach and certainly appreciate our media partners from for uh, getting the word out uh, as they have been uh, to let folks know about that change uh, we do have, again, smoke alarm Saturdays. We'll talk more about it when we get closer. Uh, Saturday, October 7th and Saturday, October 21st. We'd love to see you guys out there. We'll have city council members, myself, uh, plenty of firefighters and other folks uh, in the community helping get some of those smoke alarms installed. Uh, in the uh, last couple things, I've got, uh, we I actually was a couple minutes late coming down here. I was in a, had a phone call uh, again. We have weekly calls with American Magic. And uh, very, very excited for this is their first uh, preliminary regatta uh, that will take place uh, this weekend. And actually, there's a, I know there's a watch party that we're helping share the news on. I know Visit Pensacola is uh, at Seville Quarter Saturday, uh, Friday morning at 9 a.m. Uh, because they're racing over in Spain. Uh, but this is uh, their first chance to evaluate where they stand amongst their competition. And uh, so this is not uh, a part of the actual official America's Cup race that happens next year. Uh, but uh, if, it's a very good barometer for the, uh, for the American Magic team to see where, where they stand and where their team stands and where their boat stands against, uh, against other folks. So uh, this will not be the same size boat that they're racing uh, next year, uh, but nonetheless, this is, a, again, a good uh, watermark to, uh, to, to see how good the team is and, and certainly excited. This will be their first big uh, world-class race. Uh, since uh, we've been able to get this funding and all that. And as I've been saying, you know, they really have become our home team. So, uh, so certainly rooting for them and hope for a great result. Um, two more things, the uh, officers that are, excuse me, the, the social workers working for the police department, uh, we uh, expect them to start on October 2nd. Um, we initially uh, mentioned during budget workshop that we'd be funding one of those positions um, given Given um, what we've seen, you guys have asked me before, we've certainly seen a, a spike in, um, in, in homeless presence uh, in, in our city since the Beggs Lane closure. And uh, as we looked for, for solutions for outreach, we, we do have partners. We've, we've talked to our COC about what their plans are for outreach. Uh, we talked to, to many folks around the community, Lakeview as well. I just had a call with them yesterday. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, I would say you know, this is something that's that's important enough to us that we want to control our own destiny and and make sure that uh, we had talked about a phased approach of having one social worker and kind of learn from that and then go to a second. We're going to go ahead and fund the second. So um, so we're very very excited for the and more to come on on uh, you know who these folks are and what those responsibilities will be. Uh, to be clear, uh, there's some misperception that this is some kind of substitute for CRA officers. It is not. Uh, that we still will remain to have four CRA officers in downtown uh, that that are that are uh, tied to the CRA and CRA funding streams. These two positions are not tied uh, to that, and um, 
and they will be able to have the purview to to uh, work uh, throughout our community. So uh, the, the, neither one of them are funded by CRA sources. Um, so this is in addition to the four CRA officers that we already have. And if that means we have uh, an issue that where we need outreach, whether it be homeless reduction, whether it be mental health or anything else, uh, these two social workers are going to be able to work citywide. So um, there might be a presumption because of the, the increased presence of, of uh, homelessness downtown that they would only be able to work downtown. That is not the case. So, so very excited to get them started and, and really to start this, this uh, new, um, really new frontier for the police department that uh, not uh, about 80% of calls nationwide to in police departments don't require a gun and don't require, requires communication, requires knowing what uh, the outreach is, what, what um, resources are there to help people. Um, so this is this model is again becoming more and more popular all over the country and really excited for us to take that on uh, And last thing is our last official day for uh, Casey Lagarde um, and Unless she changes her mind. She wants to stay another day or two. That's okay um, and I think she's gonna take a couple well-deserved weeks off and wanted to of course give a big public. Thank you to, to Casey for her work uh, while I've been here and, and before she's been here and what a great asset that she's been to help uh, share news be it through disasters, uh, through the regularly scheduled weekly press conferences, and and uh, being able to to uh, be as passionate and as committed to getting the word out on all the great things uh, that are happening in the city of Pensacola, and also to communicate with our citizens when they need that communication. So, so very very grateful to Casey, and, and really excited that she's only going to be right down the street, and you know. Uh, Hopefully she isn't changing her cell phone number so we can, you know, we'll know how to get a hold of her if we can't find something that we're looking for. But, uh, but very, very excited for her and excited for Scambia County to be uh, getting a great asset. So, so thank you so much, Casey, for everything that you've done. And with that, I'll take any questions. Um, so, first of all, really what this ordinance is, is this is already a, a law of which we have to abide by. So this is not, we're not creating new law uh, here. This is, uh, but, but this does allow us the ability to be able to enforce. Um, and and uh, if you read the ordinance, what it says is, uh, you know, someone has the ability to take corrective action. Our goal is not to be writing more tickets. It, it, it's at the end of the day, if there's tables at a restaurant that has a license to use, uh, and that you can't walk through there or somebody in a wheelchair can't get through there that's already law that we have to provide that but we don't have the ability to really enforce anything um, this is going to give us a little bit more ability to enforce so um, so it as I said this is not new precedent in law it's new precedent in being able to enforce something and be able to act, to, to make that request and there be more clarity around it so um, so I think it'll be good for us I think I think it'll be a good refresher for our business our local businesses I think it'll be good for uh, ability for people to be able to move around in our downtown and, and our city um, so so certainly looking forward to whatever conversation we'll have on that on Thursday and I think that that would be a good positive step for us you may have touched on this a couple of weeks ago, but uh, sort of bring us up to date. Your, your vision now for Wayside Park mm -hmm. uh, needs a lot of work. It does. Uh, doesn't speak well to the city. Now, and we understand why it's like it is. Yeah. But what do you see going forward here? What, what are the next steps? Yeah. So what you'll see on the agenda on Thursday uh, is I would say we feel confident enough in in acquiring the resources needed to finish the project as a whole even though we don't have all those resources in-house yet uh, we've had many positive conversations with folks like fdot and others that have a vested interest in making sure that that seawall is uh, sound for uh, a 650 million dollar asset that they have as well as other uh, potential uh, resources we feel confident enough that we'll see some of those come through to finish the entire project that what we're doing is we're taking the first step and what i mean is getting a holistic thought and design around what happens from the train trestle all the way down to the fishing bridge which of course is county uh, owned and operated so um, we met the 1.4 million uh, that, that's being discussed on thursday is not enough to do all of that work but where it gets us is enough of a design uh, to make sure we can put the chimes in to go ahead and put the train trestle walk through in to make sure pedestrians don't have to again run for their life under the graffiti bridge and um, you know, those are all steps that we're going to go ahead and take 
but will the 1.4 million pay for all of the repaving, all of the picnic pavilions, you know, the bait shop down at the south end? It will not cover all of that, but we're going to start taking some of those incremental steps now. And also, with it, we'll, we'll do the trestle, we'll do the chimes, and then we'll, we will get the curb and all of the, the kind of overarching design plan completed. Uh, and then we'll, what we will hope for is we'll continue to work aggressively to get the remaining funding for the seawall, for, uh, for the parking lot, the, the picnic, the, the park itself. Uh, that, that funding source will not be covered in the 1.4. You the seawall, uh, in your mind, uh, helps FDOT protect their asset, the bridge. Mm -hmm. what, what is the linkage between the bridge uh, and that seawall? Is it? Well, I, I mean, look, I think... In just in sheer proximity, um, you know, that if, if we were to have a, a weather event, um, you know, obviously, um, you know, having that area protected, it's going to be valuable to uh, such a such an important asset. But, um, you know, again, I think this has been a long journey and it, it's it's more than time now to to get to work on on something. We were, we're three years after Sally. Uh, understandably, we've we've waited on FEMA and we've gone back and forth. Um, we continue to have those conversations, but uh, my confidence is waning in, in that being a, uh, a solution anytime soon. And I just think the citizen deserves some improvement uh, there. And uh, so, so that's why we're moving forward with this. We weren't, if this is a more of a three to $4 million project to complete as a whole, I felt comfortable enough moving ahead with the 1.4 that we have. Uh, and to not just wait till the final moment we have all three or four million in, in the bank. Um, and because if we have 1.4 and if we have any kind of delay between the, the money we have and the money we need, any decisions that we're going to make of anything that we have to get done won't be affected by those. So it's, you know, we're not going to fund half the seawall and then and have a broken other half. We're going to, we'll fund the things that we can fund and complete, the chimes, the walkthrough. Those are things that are not impacted necessarily by the seawall. So um, we, we'll, we'll do some of the things that we can and we'll continue to work aggressively. I hope I'll, really, my goal is really before we would start any kind of significant construction there, that we would at least know where the rest of those dollars are coming from. Um, so we continue to work uh, diligently on that. Following up on the on the sidewalk ordinance, yep. uh, with uh, former councilwoman Sherry Myers was here. She was kind of known for taking people on tours and pointing out areas where sidewalks would be obstructed by things like telephone poles or something like that. Yep. So the city's going to be enforcing this against the ordinance. What are y'all doing to ensure that just the nature of the sidewalk itself is passable for people in wheelchairs and that type of thing? Well. It Again, that that's already our obligation. Uh, when we build a new sidewalk, when we build, uh, when we do anything, uh, it, we're obligated to do that. Now, there can be, I, you know, I'd have to see specific examples you're talking about, uh, but obviously there's going to be legacy structure, you know, that had been put, put in place before those rules were in place that we can't, um, you know, that we don't have the the type of funding to go and change in all, all 30, 40 square miles of our city. Uh, but uh, th those those stop gaps, those steps are already in place for any time anytime we modify or put in new construction that um you know we we don't have the ability to have a a pole be in the middle of not allowing the three feet to walk through so um so yeah i mean that's that's a challenge that we have we we have done ada assessments here in years past of you know what our issues are what our uh what our opportunities for improvement are um so so if, but just rest assured anything that we are always you know currently building uh, you know, has that requirement, and, and those are things that are within our checklist of our team to make sure that that have to happen. Um, so we do everything that we can to, to make sure that we provide it. But um, we can provide it, and if there's, uh, you know, if there's something impeding it, if there's stuff in the way, if there's someone laying across the sidewalk, it could be three feet wide, and we have no ability to enforce anything at this point. So, um, you know, I think that's that's what we're really addressing here. Yeah, sure. So, um, this basically allows the city to actually enforce the um, uh, rules that are already in place, is my understanding. Mm -hmm. So, you also mentioned uh, for businesses like out on Palafox mm -hmm. with tables and stuff, yep. they could have licenses on that. So, does that mean it, this ordinance doesn't really impact those businesses on Palafox? Street? No, it does. And, and But again, uh, as I can only speak to my personal experience, I had a license to use with the state of Florida uh, in our building. and. Uh, there are requirements that you have that you sign up for to say that you're going to leave 
um, that access. So uh, when, after this first reading, of course, this ordinance will take two readings. After this first reading, we're gonna send letters out to everybody who has an LTU um, in commercial settings, anybody using the sidewalk, ultimately. Uh, most people respect uh, the, those rules. And, and look, I, I don't think any business goes out of their way to say we don't care about you know having access for people to get through there uh, they want people to walk by their business right so uh, but sometimes you may not realize the rule or you know you may not realize that two feet's not enough space to be for people to be able to get through um, so maybe it's not a big picnic bench that you buy that blocks up the road maybe it's something smaller um, so these are already obligations for uh, for these businesses to have the LTU uh, that they have to live up to but Sometimes, you know, in the midst of a million other things going on, you may not realize that you might be breaking a rule. And again, that's the spirit of this is that now, um, and, and again, we're not trying to go play gotcha with anybody. This allows us to go have that conversation and say, hey, you got to leave three feet here so people can get through. Um, and so we're going to be proactive and not just, you know, we don't want the first time someone hears about this, a, a, a restaurant or a small business is because, you know, they're being talked to about a violation. We want to be proactive and, sh and, and let them know what the rule is, remind them of what the rule is, and make sure that we can abide by it moving forward. Yeah. Right. Opening doors called uh, a meeting last week. Of, mm -hmm. it's a, I guess a committee to start the reorganization of the continuum of care. Yep. Uh, you didn't get too many of your picks on the committee. Uh, what are your, what's your reaction to the Zoom meeting? Well, uh, yeah, I wasn't on the meeting, but. Um, you, you, look, I think getting in alignment with what the national authority on, on uh, homelessness says we should do, uh, as Dr. Savage said, that we need to have some other checks and balances in place for to be successful, I think is a, a good thing. And, uh, you know, in th that's what we, of course, let opening doors know in our letter. We said, you know, this is a great start. This is a great first step. So uh, we made su suggestions. We did not say that all every person needed to be on there. Uh, but we weren't sure how it was going to be selected. We wanted to make sure that our, our voice of the city and the county were heard in terms of people that we thought that could provide value. Uh, again, that's, that's up to them at the end of the day, obviously, to set who this board is. Uh, we, we do have uh, Meredith Reeves, who's in how our housing department, is, is on. Um, and I know that Councilwoman Patton on city council is part of that group. Uh, and, and I made clear in our agenda conference on Monday, uh, that was not a, we were not offered a designation. You know, we didn't, they didn't say the city could have a, you know, someone in administration and then we picked. Um, that was, they, they made their picks. That's perfectly fine. Meredith is, is more than qualified uh, to, to talk uh, on, on, uh, on these topics and has been around them a long, long time. So we will have some city presence on that. And, uh, but, but we're, you know, of course, we're going to be pay paying attention, uh, not just paying attention from an oversight perspective, but from a collaboration perspective. We, we all want the same thing. We all want the same thing. And that's, um, you know, so any implication that we don't want the same thing is uh, we want to do the best that we can to bring the resources to this community that can help reduce homelessness. That's the bottom line. Um, so we, maybe we disagree on tactics every now and then, uh, but we all want the same result. So. Um, so I, I look forward to see if the, hopefully this is a great positive step and I, I hope opening doors and John see this is a great positive step that they've got more people in the room that care about what they do every day and 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 can help help collaborate and and, and bring more resources so uh, so we'll see how things go um, that that's where we're at uh, but uh, you know if they call on us or call on me to, to try to be helpful to them uh, certainly I'll, I'll do everything I can to do so yep Yes. Um, are they still being tested? And are you hearing drivers complaining for hazardous? Yeah, uh, I have not heard any complaints about uh, the hazardous nature. No, um, I, I'm probably doing an update from FDOT. I know the last update was that uh, yes, they were still testing, and remember, part of their testing is also a certain amount of burn time. You know, it's not just do they turn on or not. It's that they have to run for a certain amount of time. Um, but uh, we'll probably do an update. We'll follow up um, with you and, and uh, get back with you next week. But there was also um, some um, clearance from the Coast Guard that the FDOT was waiting on, nothing to do with us. Uh, but certainly looking forward to getting uh, those, those lights up and going and getting a plan in place uh, for those lights. Uh, we will not control those at the end of the day. FDOT will, will have the remote for uh, what they want to do with the lights. But, uh, but yeah, we, I think our last update was in July, so we'll, we'll follow back up with them. 
clear that the Southern Rail Commission met last week in Point Clear over uh, on the Mobile Bay. Mm -hmm. um, but there was no, I mean, they, they, obviously they said the Gulf Coast Rail Service is now going to move to the right because of difficulties in the city of Mobile. Mm -hmm. did, did, will you hear anything uh, about Mobile to the east that came out of that meeting? Uh, I have I have not gotten any updates. I know the last uh, position that we've been in is we've been working with some of our uh, rail partners, um, really actually two different rail partners on two different projects um, or two different grant streams. Uh, one was with uh, Pensacola East to Jacksonville with Rail USA uh, about some rail improvements that they want to make that could uh, accommodate passenger rail. So we're working side by side with their grant folks. It's their grant application uh, that would be several million dollars that would help improve the rail. So it's something that we would need to have happen. Uh, but uh, that's a little bit more with their world than our world in terms of you know those what those rail infrastructure grants look like. So we're a, certainly a willing and collaborative partner. So we're working on that, and we've actually started some preliminary conversations. Uh, there's some grant opportunities out there to remove rail um, that's not being used or to redirect rail. Um, if actually, if you walk, if you drive down Main Street right now, you see a lot of rail that isn't being used. You know, especially from A to E, and we've been in conversations with the rail owner there, uh, and we're going to work with their grant folks about uh, coming up with an opportunity to actually remove that rail, and maybe that could be space for a multi-use path or some other things as well. So, those on the rail side, those are the last two updates. Uh, of course, we have put in for the for the um, corridor ID grant program. But I'll have to get an update from Erica on, on week to week. I know we have not heard back uh, a yes or no on that yet. Yesterday, the, the CRA had a discussion item on the Malcolm Young Gym. Yes. Uh, what, what was the result of that discussion? What's the city doing now? So uh, we, what we really wanted to hear from, from the CRA board was uh, any feedback or desires that they would have for the future of the property. Uh, we uh, – you give – I know all of us have talked about it several times. Uh, our first intent was to accommodate Lighthouse Christian, the current leaseholder uh, for Malcolm Young, which we have done that. And again, special credit to our Parks and Rec Department that has, we've had to use three different resource centers to make that happen. And when you have college basketball and high school basketball and PE, um, that was not an easy lift for us. Uh, but it was the right thing to do. Uh, that even even if it wasn't the legal obligation, it was, in my mind, the ethical obligation to say that if we give you 365 day out in a contract that we should perform for those 365 days as if the building was intact. So uh, once we met that obligation, that we, we didn't want to move forward with any decisions. Uh, where it stands now is we are going to get a price for demolition of the building. Um, we've had uh, one uh, rough estimate of what it would take not to refurbish the building, but just to get it to a point where uh, people can go back in the building that it would be safe enough to, for people to return, uh, and that's north of a million dollars. So um, that, that's not new bathrooms, that's not ADA compliance, that's not all the, the buckling wood floors, it's none of that. That's, uh, that would just be to allow people to inhabit the building. Um, so you can imagine if we were to refurbish that building into something uh, that, that we could be proud of, uh, then we're talking exponentially higher than that. So uh, we're going to look at a price for demolition. That that price is going to be predicated on any kind of remediation. So as we sit here today, what we're looking at is uh, we're getting an assessment of you know, potential asbestos, things like that, which of course affect the cost of demolition. So since that's in the CRA district, uh, and and with demolition, and we certainly have eyes on on opportunities for housing there. Um, and that, of course, the CRA, that CRA property, would, the CRA would be the tax beneficiary of, of whatever would happen there, then that we would be eventually coming back to the CRA to ask them to fund that demolition. So before we did that, we wanted to have an open conversation with the CRA board uh, about any thoughts or concerns that they may have uh, with that building. But, you know, another thing to keep in mind is we also had a 20-year lease with Lighthouse. So even if we were to go down the road of spending a million dollars just to stand it back up, we have a $20 a year lease for the next 18 or so years. So even a refurbishment, I, and I shared that with the CRA board last night, even a refurbishment, uh, I mean, it would probably be our duty to return the building in some way back to the leaseholder at $20 a year. So you'd have to keep, you have to factor that into the economics as well as it'd be about a million dollar lift 
uh, and that would not go back into the public realm. It would go back into a privately held lease. Um, if now we could opt out of that, but I don't know that that's what we would do if our goal was to refurbish the building. So, so I think it's time for a new start uh, at that property, and that the the first step of that is is the demolition. And uh, right now, our staff is uh, assessing what we have uh, at the, at Malcolm Young as a whole, that entire parcel, uh, how many units can be built there, what can be built there. Um, and uh, I know personally I have uh, a, a preference on eyes on workforce housing there, kind of that 80 to 80 percent AMI to 120 percent AMI. And, you know, I said in the campaign and, I've, uh, and I can maintain that, you know, we have police officers, we have firefighters, we have teachers in this community who can't afford to live in this community. Um, and so we, we pay them a wage of which they can't afford to live in the city of, that they protect or that they enrich with, when you have teachers teaching our children. So. Um, so there, we can talk about homeless uh, transitional housing. We can talk about market rate housing. Uh, we can talk about workforce. We need all of it. And I think that the Malcolm Young property in particular is a perfect place for us to uh, look at. If we've got, we're working on Pensacola Motor Lodge, uh, maybe p potentially homeless transitional, potentially more of a 60% AMI, something that's going to take a little bit more of a subsidy. I, I see the Malcolm Young property is as a pilot program like the Motor Lodge, kind of a pilot program for a potential workforce housing partnership uh, with, with the private sector to see uh, how many houses we can get and how, how long we can keep those uh, in the affordable pool uh, based on what the asset that we have. So uh, understand, I said this in the CRA board meeting, that uh, Senate Bill 102 is going to change a lot. So uh, we're going to make an assessment, and our, our planning team and our housing team is going to say, come back and say, you can put X number of units on this property, you can do uh, duplexes, you can do single family. We're going to get that assessment as it sits in our code today, but understand, from what we've already learned preliminarily about Senate Bill 102, that can change dramatically. I mean, there are there are exceptions within Senate Bill 102. I mentioned last night, one of them to the board, is there's going to be an exception in certain elements where you can pick whatever the tallest building within a mile of your property is, and you can build that tall. I mean, that's I'm not saying that can happen at Malcolm Young. I'm just saying that's the kind of dramatic preemption change that could take place there. Um, and so at the end of the day, we do own the property and we would RFP to our preferences. So uh, we would have a little more control. It's not just privately owned property where uh, they'd be able to do whatever they wanted within the rules. Uh, so we do, we can control that if there's something in 102 maybe uh, that, that uh, isn't ideal or that we wouldn't want to see. Uh, but that it, it, we are entering a new frontier, truly, in uh, what what housing projects are going to look like, housing developments are going to look like uh, moving forward. So, um, so we'll get an objective assessment of our, of what uh, the code allows, what our land development code allows there, uh, and then we'll move forward. Uh, but uh, the next step for us is we're going to get a demolition price. We'll bring that back to the CRA board um, and propose that to them. And then, of course, the second phase of that would be an RFP to have a bigger conversation about what we want there. You know, what, what we want to put in that RFP as what we prefer to see if somebody were to bid on the property. And, and, um, I guess, have y'all gotten any uh, communication from the state on what the exact, you know, rulemaking down of Senate Bill 102 is as far as those I haven't got a, a full update, and, and maybe we, we may have gotten one, you know, from on the staff level. Um, and, and just as a reminder, that's Senate Bill 102 is one of the inspirations of why we're hiring someone uh, in in our economic development office around market rate housing um, because we know that there's going to we're going to need some additional resources to help see these projects through given all the new rules. Um, so the last update I got was when Senator Broxson, uh, I'm grateful to him and his team for bringing in uh, really the the folks that are, are on top of that. Uh, a couple months ago, uh, he had them come in and, and present to about 40 or 50 folks. Um, and so the things I'm telling you today are things I've learned from then. Uh, I haven't heard anything recently in the last week or so, but my understanding was generally by this fall, we're going to have, you know, a, a, a much cleaner idea uh, of what needs to be put in place. Um, yeah, another example uh, that, that was mentioned was um, that the tax abatement that would be preempted would be on projects, multifamily projects over 70 units. And whatever percentage of that project, uh, so let's say 30% of your 100-unit building 
was going to be uh, for 80 percent AMI, uh, that that you would be able to apply each year to the state of Florida to get a 75 percent tax abatement on that portion of your project, and then you would apply annually. And if you go lower than that, then there's a chance you can get 100 percent uh, tax abatement. So uh, again, not saying what will or won't happen to Malcolm Young specifically, but those those are the type of tactics that are going to be put in place at 102 and. Uh, and it'll be a learning experience for all of us. I think it'll be a learning experience in the private market, and it'll be a learning experience for the city. All right. Anything else? All right. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it.